Hi, welcome to chapter 12, using the security market line to measure investment performance. In this tutorial, we're going to look at annual return data for three companies, the S&P 500. We're going to compare those to the risk-free rate as measured by a 10-year UST bill, and we're going to do that to calculate excess returns and to put together a portfolio containing a third of each stock. And we're going to see how that portfolio compared against the S&P 500 on a risk-adjusted basis. So we're going to start with the data that I brought in. I have annual returns data for three companies, Whole Foods, Merck, and JCPenney's. I also have annual return data for the S&P 500 as retrieved from Yahoo and risk-free rate as measured by a 10-year UST bill that I showed how to do in a previous tutorial. If you're having trouble getting that data, you can look up an earlier tutorial. So step one is to compare how much extra you would have earned by investing in either Whole Foods, Merck, JCPenney's, or the S&P 500, rather than investing in the risk-free U.S. T-bill. So how we start is we say that we're going to take Whole Foods. You could have, you, if you invested in Whole Foods, you'd have earned 2.7% return. However, had you invested in a risk-free T-bill, you'd have earned 1.69%. And that gives you what we like to call an excess return a return in excess of the risk-free rate of just under 1%. Now I want to show you a trick here. We're going to have to calculate excess returns for everything between this cell here and the S&P 500 here, right? We've got four rows and 10 columns, eight columns, nine columns. If I go up here into my formula bar and I click over here on the F7, and the F7 is what corresponds over here to the risk-free rate. And I hit Command-T on my Mac. If you're on a PC, you'd hit F4. You'd see those dollar signs come up. And so the dollar sign F, dollar sign 7, means you're going to stay in column F, you're going to stay in row 7. If I keep hitting that dollar sign, see how it moves? I'm mean, sorry, if I keep hitting the, the Command-T, see how the dollar signs move? What I want is to stay in row F and let the row, value, uh, let the row vary. So I hit... Command T, you'd hit F4 until you had dollar F and then nothing over 7, meaning stay in row F but let the row vary. When I do that and I drag it down, I get my percentage returns in excess of the risk free rate for Whole Foods. What that saves us is having to calculate it for each additional column. Then what I can do is highlight Whole Foods excess returns and drag them over. And then what you'll see is that if you click in any given cell, say this cell with a 32.3 excess return for JCPenney, it's going to correspond to JCPenney's return in April 2011 in excess of the risk-free rate during April 2011. If we're over here in the S&P excess return, for April 2007, it's 8.48. What it means is that in that given month, April 2007, the S&P's, the S&P 500 returned 8.48% more than the risk-free rate. So it can save you a little bit of work. So after we've done that, what we're going to do is plot the excess returns of each company against the S&P 500. So. Instead of me doing every single one, I'm going to do Merck because I did Whole Foods in an earlier tutorial. So if I want to plot Merck's excess returns against the S&P 500s, I start by highlighting Merck's returns and then I hit Command, I believe it's Control if you're on a PC, I hold that down and then I highlight the S&P's returns. That allows me to do a plot that has data from two columns when the columns aren't right next to one another. And then from there, the process is the same as we've seen before. We do an XY scatter, pardon me, an XY marked scatter, and it pops up as such. I'm going to drag it over to the side. We're going to cover some other data, but that's not going to be that important for a second. My first step is to make sure that I have my S&P return on the X axis and Merck's on the Y. So in order to do that, I find a point. Here we go. We're at a point where it's on the x-axis is 50.56% and on the y is 8.48. Okay, that's backwards. I need to have the S&P on the y. It needs to be 
comma 50.56. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my axes by selecting data. I right click and I choose select data. You can either remove this series or you can just change the X and Y values. So I'm going to take out what used to be the X values and I'm going to replace them with what I'd like to be the X values. Then I'll take out what used to be the Y values and I'll replace them with what I'd like to be the Y values. I hit OK and it seems to be changed. So here's that same point where Merck returned 50.5% on the Y and the S&P returned 8 on the X. So I've got a couple of things to do. I need to insert my trend line, I need to show my equation and my R squared on the chart, and I need to add a title, and I need to label my axes. Um, and I guess I also would like to adjust these percentage numbers so that instead of showing two decimals, they show none. So I'm going to start with the title. My chart title is going to be Merck Excess Returns on the S&P 500 2004 to 2013. That's a huge title. I'm going to make it smaller so it fits. Great. I'm going to get rid of this legend and I'll label my axes. I've got Merck on the Y and S&P on the X. So I think that these percentage points with two decimals is clutter. So I'm going to format this axis. I'm going to format the number and here I need to unlink it from the source so that we can have two decimal, instead of two decimal places we can have none. Same with the X. Format it unlink it from the source and show two decimals. So that's a little bit easier to see. Get the axis labels out of the way. And insert the trend line. Click on one, right click, add trend line. The format trend line box comes up. Click options, display R squared, display equation. Click OK. Move it someplace where it's legible, not in the way. So this is my first graph looking at Merck against the S&P 500. So we see here that the slope of this line, 1.1056, that should be the beta of Merck, and the intercept, negative 0.104, otherwise known as 1.04% negative, should be the intercept, um, or our alpha. So let's compare that to the data that we get when we use Excel's functions. So alpha again is the point at which the trend line intersects the y-axis. So what would this company return in a year that the S&P returned zero? It lets us know if this firm underperforms or overperforms the S&P on a risk-adjusted basis. And that's intercept. My known y's, of course, are my, is my company and my known X's is the S&P. I'm going to take this opportunity to give the S&P 500 an absolute reference so that I can drag that formula so I don't have to recalculate the intercept, the beta, and the R squared for both Whole Foods and JCPenney's. So my alpha negative 1.04 percent, it matches my trend line. The beta is the slope. My known Y's are Merck. My known X's are the S&P. Giving it an absolute reference, my beta is 1.106, looking a lot like 1.1056. Let's give both of these one additional decimal place so that they match up exactly. Then the last is the R squared, Excel function RSQ. Known Y's are Merck's excess returns. Known X's are the S&P 500 excess returns. Given the S&P 500 an absolute reference, our R squared is 0.46, meaning that 
of the flexibility of Merck's very vari the variation of Merck's returns can be explained by movements in the S and P. So there we have an alpha, a beta, and an R squared that match up with the values on our graph, and that's important. You will then go ahead on your homework and create a plot like we just did for your other two firms, and then you'll create a portfolio with the plot of the portfolio returns against the S&P like we did here. I will just finish this up by calculating or dragging these formulas to the side in order to have my alpha, beta, and R squared for those three companies. All right, if you need anything else, don't forget to drop an email and I can post a tutorial for you on another topic if there's something else you're confused on. Talk to you later. Bye.